series. And last week we talked about the game of life. How many of you guys played the game of life whenever you were growing up? How many of you played it last week after we talked about it? Games of life. Well, today we're going to talk, we're going to take a look at the game Connect Four. And you may be looking at this thing that I have up here and, and you're thinking, well, that's not Connect Four. And I agree. But if you if you walk down the uh, if you walk down the aisle at Walmart with all the games, you'll see that they've taken a lot of the old school games and they've uh, they've done them up. They've they've made them better. And so we went and, uh, we went and got a we went and got the Connect Four game, and uh, this was the best that we could get. Actually, if you put it all together, it's it's pretty big. So I don't have everything put together, but this slides all the way up, and these are bouncy balls and what you do is you bounce the balls into this rack and you try to connect four by bouncing the balls I'm not really sure exactly what we're trying to teach our kids but <laughs> probably probably not the the best way to go with the connect four game but um, anyway this is going to be our our connect four for today the way that you win everybody knows the way that you win at connect four because it's pretty self-explanatory is that you connect four of your color they can be in a row or they can be in a column or they can be diagonal but you connect four pieces and so today we're going to talk about the four things that we need to connect in our lives if we are going to win at the game of life as a church we have a mission we have a vision, and we have core values. The core values of our church are discipleship is a core value of our church. Missions is a core value of our church. Community is one of our core values. Students and the next generation is one of our core values. Advancing, always getting better in everything that we do is one of our core values. We have a vision of our church, what we are trying to do. We're growing, equipping, and sending disciples of Jesus Christ. So we have core values, we have a vision, and we have a mission. And the mission is the most foundational part. It is to be the New Testament church. We want to be the New Testament church in action and belief. That means that we want to, as best we can, live like the New Testament church. How many of you know that the New Testament church, the, the early church, we are not another church besides that church. We are an extension of the early church. And so, as we see in Acts, the early church was formed. We should act and live and believe like the early church did because we are an extension about of that church. What we're going to discover today is that the New Testament church was all about community. And we live in a society that's all about winning by yourself. Right? When you're playing Connect Four, it's one-on-one. -on -one. You're trying to win by yourself. So many of the games that we'll talk about in this series, they're all about you winning alone. And if you look back to the, to the New Testament church, the early church, that's actually the opposite of what they did. They did everything in community, and we're going to look at that this morning. Instead of trying to win at life alone, I, wanna, I want us to look at four ways that the early church was connected because I believe that the church is the strongest when we as the individuals uh, that make up the church when we're connected in these four ways. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter number 2. That's where we're going to be this morning. Acts 2 beginning in verse number 42. Acts 2, 42. The New Testament church is being formed in Acts 2, 42 through 47 tells us a lot about the way that they lived their lives. Acts 2, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Verse 43. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God 
and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. How many of you guys want to be a part of a church like that? And the Lord added to their number. How often? Day by day. Every single day, God was adding to the number of them because people were coming into relationship with Jesus. Well, if we want that same result, and I believe that we all do, if we want the same result that the New Testament church was getting, then we should probably look at what they were doing to get that result. We see that in verses 42 through 47. We see the way that they were living, what they were devoted to, what they were connected to. And because they were connected to all the right things, God was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And today we're going to be very, very practical. We're going to talk about foundational ideas about following Jesus. I don't think that there's probably going to be anything that we talk about today that you've never heard before, but I found in my life and my walk with Jesus that sometimes it's good to go back and check in on the most basic things to make sure that my foundation is still stable. Right? Danik and I were talking about this last week, how we we really strive in, in all areas of our life, we really strive to be the very best that we can, and it seems like we've got about four or five things big areas of life that we really focus on and it seems like whenever we make really big strides in another area if we're not careful we'll come back and check another thing and that thing will have just completely fallen off and so then we'll pick that thing up and we'll work really hard on it and we'll be really focused on that and then we'll come back and check the other thing that was doing good just a month or two ago and now that thing has fallen off and so it's important to go back and check just the foundational things about following Jesus. We're going to talk about four ways to connect, and these are our foundation, really foundational things. Number one, connect with God. Connect with God. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayers. They were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. They were devoted to going to church all the time with each other. They were devoted to connecting with God. Whenever I was growing up, I had I, I came up with what I called the big three. My mom was teaching our Sunday school class one time, and she said, you know, how do you get closer to God? Well, you, you got to do the big three. You got to read your Bible, you got to go to church, and you got to pray. You read your Bible, you go to church, you pray, then you're going to stay connected to God. I I want to talk about that for just a minute. When when you pray, I want to encourage you to have a dedicated place and time every single day that you pray. Really practical today. Have a dedicated place and a dedicated time. Your time does not have to be 5 o'clock in the morning. Let me tell you, my time is not 5 o'clock in the morning. Okay? If your time, if, if you are up at 5 o'clock, then peace be with you. If you want to have your time at 5 o'clock in the morning, that's absolutely okay. If you want to have your time at lunch, during your lunch hour, that's fine. If you want to have your time right before you go to bed at night, I don't care when you have your time. I just want to encourage you to have a dedicated time. Every time, every single day, I go to this place at this time, and this is the place where I meet with God. There's something that changes when you get to that place at that time when you know that yesterday and the day before and last week and last month and last year, I met with God in this place. So when we pray, we want to pray daily. We want to have a dedicated place and a dedicated time. Read our Bibles. We don't want to just read our Bibles, though. I don't want you just to pick up your Bible every day and say, okay, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Here. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Hey, that's one of my favorites. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. But then tomorrow you do the same thing and you're reading in Judges. Here's why I don't want you to read the Bible that way. Because that's not how the Bible is written. That's not how we treat books. 
You don't pick up any other book and just randomly turn to a place and read a, a couple of paragraphs and then the next day pick up the same book and turn to a different place and read a couple more paragraphs. How do we read books? We read them systematically. I'm not saying that you have to pick up your Bible and read all the way through it from Genesis all the way back through Revelation, but whenever you get in a book, read all the way through that book. Why? Because that book was written as one piece. God inspired man to write that book as one piece. In the New Testament, oftentimes there were one letter to people, and so we want to read our Bibles systematically. We don't just want to read, we want to study there's a huge difference between reading God's Word and studying God's Word. There's a big difference. We don't just want to read. We want to start there. But we also want to make sure that we're studying the Word of God. That we're going back and we're seeing what was happening then and there. Why did this author, why did God inspire this author to write this particular thing to these particular people? Who, who were they writing to? What were those people going through? We want to know as much as we can about the text. And really cool things happen whenever you start to study out the Word of God. When you start to see that these people were going through this thing, and then God said this thing, and it makes it so much more real having some context behind the scripture, as opposed to just picking it up and reading a couple verses and then setting it back down and check that off the spiritual list today. That's not what we want to do. We want to study God's word. So we want to study the word, we want to pray, and we want to go to church. We're going to talk about this one more later, but connection and spiritual refilling happens in the presence of God. And church is not the only place where you can experience the presence of God. I understand that. But church is a place, an important place, where you can experience a connection with God and a refilling with God. Connecting with God is not like a secret club that only a certain few people are allowed into. I don't have access to a different dimension to the presence of God because I am a pastor. Everyone can experience the presence of God on a real level, but get this, because this is going to be a theme throughout the day. You have to choose to connect. You have to choose to connect with God. You got to choose to connect. Connecting with God happens at church, but it cannot be the only time and place where we're connecting with God. If you're only connecting with God in this room on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, then you're not connecting enough with God to build a relationship. And you know that. You wouldn't try to build a relationship with anybody else that way. Talk to them for 30 minutes, one time a week. Come in. Whenever we come, we come in. Some weeks we miss, and we just don't get any time with the person that week. It's not how we build relationships. We build relationships on a daily basis basis the great thing about about this connection point connecting with God is that we can always get closer to God right you can always get closer to God there's always a new level that we can reach and God is not moving God is not playing spiritual hide and seek with you He's not bouncing around thinking, oh, if they find me over here, then I'll talk to him for a little bit, and then I'm going to run over here. God wants to be found by you, and God is not moving. He's constant. He's steady. He's always the exact same. So if you're not connecting with God, it's not because God is not available to connect with. It's because you're making a choice to not connect. We've got to make a choice to connect. What does this look like in real life? We make a choice to watch reruns because that's more important than reading my Bible. Well, it got quiet. We made a choice today that food is more important than a fast. Made a choice that talking to my friends today and scrolling through Facebook with people who aren't really my friends, that that's more important than talking to God. We get to make choices about what we are going to be devoted to. And our daily devotion to God has got to be a top priority if we want to win in life. 
That's why our church is paying for everyone who goes to our church right now to have a right now media account because of the Bible studies that we can put out because we want you to be connected. We want to equip you, right? That's our vision. We're growing, equipping, and sending disciples. We want to equip you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and to connect with God, not just on Sundays, but every single day. And so if you haven't gotten into the Right Now Media stuff yet, I was talking to somebody this morning before church that was talking about how great the Ephesians study that we're doing is. It's awesome stuff. It's high-quality production. It's really great stuff. Why are we doing that? Why are we investing the money in that? Because we want to equip people to grow in their relationship with God where they can connect on a daily basis. You have to choose to connect with God. Number two, we're going to connect with God. Number two is we're going to connect with family. We're going to connect with family. Verse 44 through 46. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. I want you to think about what this sounds like. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had a need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So they were all together, they were unified. They had all things in common. They were helping each other out with resources, and they ate together in their homes, and they went to church together. That sounds like a family to me. When we think about family, so often we think about blood relatives, and those people are family. But I also believe that you can do life so closely with some people who aren't relatives that those people can become your family. We talk about church family a lot around here, and it's not something that we just say flippantly. It's not just something that we say as a filler. We want people who come into this space on Sundays to feel like they are family. We want to be connected with our family on a real level. Just like in the early church, we want to be unified. We want to help each other when there's a need. We want to eat together. We want to go to church together. We want our church to be like a weekly family reunion where we get to see people that we, some of the people who we love the most in the world and connect with them and pray with them and encourage them. You can't pick your relatives. How many of you know that's true? You were just born, you just woke up, and they were. The good, the bad, and the ugly. They were just there. <laughs> you can't pick that part of your family. Your relatives' family, they just are who they are. But you can choose who you do life with. You can choose who your family is. I want to be connected with our church family. But here's the thing. Again, this is going to be a theme throughout the day. You have to choose to be connected. You have to choose to be connected to your church family. How many of you know that there are no perfect families? Well, just like there are no perfect families, guess what? There are no perfect churches. We're not the exception to the rule. We're flawed. But choosing to not connect with a church because that church is not exactly how I would prefer it to be does not make logical sense. Have you ever gone to a family reunion with extended family? Are there any more awkward situations in life than going to a family reunion with extended family? It's awkward because you don't talk to them very often. You don't know what's going on in their lives. You know that you probably will not see them again for a long time. It's strange to you. Why? Because you've made a choice to not connect with those people. So then when you get around those people, the situation becomes awkward. If you never show up, you're not going to feel like family. It's the exact same way in the church. If you make a choice to not connect, then when you show up to the family reunion, it's going to be weird. Why? Because I've made a choice to not connect. So when somebody reaches out, if you want to feel like family, and somebody reaches their hand out, here's what you got to do. you got to reach back. 
if you want to feel like a part of the family. Someone reaches out and you don't reach back, you're not going to feel connected. You're not going to feel like family. Amber and Christian have a son named Knox, and since we've been here, we've been privileged enough to go to all of Knox's birthdays, so it's like three birthdays now, I think, one, two, and three. And so, he's three, right? I got it right. One, two, and three. All the birthdays. We, we've been at all the birthdays. And so, Judah, ever since his birthday was over last January, has been planning for his next birthday. At that birthday party, he was saying, next, birth, my, next year, I'm going to be five. At his fourth birthday party, just looking forward to turning five. Because whenever he turns five, he gets to go into the green room at church. And he's really excited about going into the green room at church. And so he, he's stoked about it. He's been planning his birthday party. But what happens is, when he gets invited to another kid's birthday party, that's what, on the way home, he's like, Hey, Dad, can we do that for our birthday party? So this last... Knox's last birthday party was at Chuck E. Cheese, and so, of course, Judah loves Chuck E. Cheese, and we were going home. Hey, Dad, I got an idea. What? Well, for my fifth birthday party, I'll, can we go to Chuck E. Cheese? We can do whatever you decide that you want to do whenever it comes time to have that party. And so we were talking about it a couple days later. Judah was asking who was coming over to the house or who we were getting together with, and I said, well, we're going to get together with our family and Judah said, well, is not, he calls him Noxie. He said, is Noxie going to be there? And I said, well, no, because we're getting together with our family. And he said, well, Noxie's my family. <laughs> and I almost corrected him and said, well, actually, bud, he, he's not your family. But I didn't because I want my son to be so connected and to be so close with the people who are in this community that they're just like family. If family's going to be there, then Knox should be there because he's my friend and he's like my family. But you know what? Do you know the only way that that could happen? The only way is that when Christian and Amber reached out and said, hey, you can come to our birthday party. You're invited to Knox's birthday party. The only way that Judah feels like Knox is family is because when they reached out, we reached back. We reached back. We made a choice to be connected. You have to intentionally choose to connect on that level. There's no relationship in the world where you can put in no effort no sacrifice and expect that relationship to work. And it's the exact same with your church family. Number three, we have to connect with the church. Connect with church. So we're connecting with God, we're connecting with family, and we're talking about church family, but we're also going to be connected to church. And day by day, attending the temple together. I want you to think about what that's saying. Because if we were really going to live this out, like exactly what Acts 2, 42 through 47 says, if we were really going to live this out in our lives, then tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we'd do this again. And then Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., we'd do this again. And then Wednesday, we do it again. And then Thursday, we do it again. There were no days off from going to church. And day by day, attending the temple together the early church that were so faithful to the house of god that the bible says that they went every day it was a normal part of the rhythm of their lives was to go to temple was to go to church together now i don't know this for a fact because i wasn't here but i've been told by many credible people that 50 years ago if you were faithful to church if you were considered someone who was faithful to church that meant that you went on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other night of the week that they decided that they were going to have church. And for the most part, again, 50 years ago, for the most part, that was without any established children's ministry, 
It was without any established youth ministry, right? Where was the nursery? It was under the pew at mom's feet with some blocks, right? I've heard the stories. Even though the ministries were not developed, watch this, people chose to be faithful. They chose to be faithful. We get to choose to be connected to the point where church attendance is not optional, but it's a normal part of the rhythm of our lives. It's a normal part of the rhythm of our lives. Do you know why the early church needed to go to church every day? Think about it. Why did the early church need to go to church and get refilled every single day? Every single day. Do you know what happens whenever we leave church or what's supposed to happen? What was happening in the early church because we know that people were being saved every single day because they were going out from the temple and they were ministering all day long and people were being saved. Do you know what that takes? It takes spiritual energy from you. If you're going out and ministering and you're, going be, and you're being a productive part of the kingdom of God, it is going to spiritually drain you. So do you know why the early church went to church every day? Because they were giving out so much that they knew. See, here's what happens. We come to church, we get filled, we go out. This is what naturally happens. There's going to be a flow from our lives. And then we go back, we reconnect with God. And there's going to be a flow from our lives. Lives. As long as we're connecting with God, then we have something to give out. There's going to be a flow. Whenever we go to work, there's going to be a flow spiritually. Whenever we're home and we're discipling our kids, whenever we're studying God's word with our spouses, they're going to, there's going to be a flow from our lives spiritually. But what happens when we don't refill? There's nothing to pour out. You can't pour water out from an empty cup so why did the disciples go day by day by day by day by day because they were pouring out so much that they craved being refilled they were giving so much that they knew if i don't go back if we don't go back and get refilled today then tomorrow i'll have nothing at all to give the only way that they could go and make new disciples day by day, God add to their number day by day, was that they go and connect with God and get refilled day by day. When you're constantly and consistently pouring out, you also have to constantly and consistently be being poured in too. You need to fill up consistently. But as a culture, we've become so concerned with what the church should be doing for us that we have forgotten that we are the church so consumed with what church should be for me that I've forgotten to be the church we've made church a service to attend where we're ministered to and it is that but we've forgotten that we are the church who should be ministering who should be giving out on a regular basis so much so that we crave the next time shouldn't feel like an obligation to get up and come to the house of god we should crave it we should desire it we should want it we should be running into the weekend spiritually on empty i cannot wait to get back and get refilled again i understand that you can refill and you should refill every day by yourself you should do that but there is nothing like coming together with family coming together who, with people who you do life and community with and experiencing the presence and the power of God all together. That's why we're told, we're commanded in the Bible not to forsake 
the assembling of ourselves together. It's important that we all come together and refill so that we can go out and pour out into our community. We have to connect with the church. If we want to win, we have to choose, choose, we have to choose to intentionally connect. Number four, last one, connect with community. We've got to connect with our community. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Who do they have favor with? Not just their church, not just their family, not just their circle. The Bible says that, that they had favor with everybody. Everyone who was in their community, this group of people had favor with everyone. And the Lord added to their number every day because they were going out and sharing the good news of Jesus every day. You know, all of the other connections are ultimately for our good. Connect with God, that's good for you. Connect with family, that's good for you. Connect with the church, that's good for you. But connecting with community, here we connect and is it good for us when we connect with the community? Yes, but it's better for the community. Will you be blessed when you connect with the community? Absolutely you will be. But how much more blessed is the person who's lost and dying and on their way to hell right now who you extend grace and love and mercy to? How much more blessed are they because you made a choice to go into the community and to be a blessing? Doing our adoptive park and our kids' gym outreach this last week was so so awesome it was the second week that we've actually just gone to the park and and just been out there at the park the the first week three weeks ago we canvassed through some neighborhoods and and told people we were going to be there and then the first week so two weeks ago that we were just at the park we had one family come and i was excited about the one family and we got to pray with the, that that person and and uh it, it was really it was great and so i'm thinking okay week number two if we can double, I mean, if we could get two families, if we could get three families, that would be great. And we had two families who were almost waiting on us whenever we got there. And then we had another family about 30 minutes later, and then we had another family about 30 minutes later. And so we had gotten up to four, and I'm thinking, this has been a good day. I mean, if we can do that again next week, that's great. I mean, that is ministry, and we're able to pray with these families, and it was awesome. And so it was about 10 till... And we hadn't seen anybody for a long time, and so we kind of started loading our stuff up, and a couple people left. And we were about to pull away, and in the rearview mirror, I saw somebody pulling up into the, the park, and I thought, well, they may be coming, and sure enough, they were. And there were two households in that truck. And then while we were filling them, another car pulled up that had three different families in that car. So then we were up to five extras. And then while we were filling that one, another one pulled up. While we were filling that one, another two pulled up. While we were filling that one, another one pulled up. We ended up in the last 15 minutes, we served nine different families in the last 15 minutes. We ended up serving 13 families. We got rid of practically everything that we had in the van. And we told them at the, at the end, we told them, hey, come back next week because we'll have the same stuff, but we'll have more than what we're able to give you right now because we just got overran there at the very, at the very end. The, and the really cool thing is and being a part of and watching as we're able to pray with these people because they're, it's, it's really not that hard. It's really not that hard to make a spiritual connection with somebody. We make it into this big, scary thing. Like, I'm going to go, I'm going to have to go up to them with my Bible, and I'm going to have to explain, you know, all the theology that I, that I understand, and what if they ask me a question that I don't know. But it's, it's really not that complicated just to walk up to somebody who you're blessing and say, hey, what can I pray with you about today? And they'll tell you. The opportunity to pray with them has been, it's been awesome. It's been a great experience so far. But the only way that we can sustain that spiritually is if we're being refilled over and over and over again. Because eventually, you'll have nothing to give out. There will be someone standing in front of you who needs you to be filled with the Spirit. And you will have nothing to give them unless you continually connect with God. It is good for you to be connected with the community, but 
It's the difference between eternal life and death for them. If you're connected with God, you're good. For all eternity, you're set. But being connected to the community is going to be the difference between heaven and hell for people. And you have to be filled when it's time to go. If you're not connected to the community, it's not because there's a, a lack of need. If you're not connected to the community, it's not because there's a lack of ministry. If you're not connected to the community, it's not because there's a lack of opportunity to go into the community. If you're not connected to the community, it's because you have made a choice to not connect. We're all busy. Busy doesn't have anything to do with it. Everybody's busy. It has to do with priorities. It has to do with prioritizing the kingdom of God above the kingdom that I'm establishing here on this earth. We have to choose to be connected with our community if there's any hope to reaching our community for Jesus. If they were going to seek us out, we've been here long enough that they would have found us by now. Right? It's not a secret when we show up here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. It's not a secret. It's everywhere. You can download an app, you can go to the website, you can go to Facebook, you can call the phone. You can do a lot of different things to find out where we are and when we are. So if they were going to pursue us, don't you think they would have done it by now? They would have found us by now. We've not been called to come to church and to sit and wait. We've been called to go. We've been called to go into our community and make disciples go and make disciples you have to connect all four we're going to connect with god we're going to connect with family we're going to connect with our church we're going to connect with our community show of hands how many of you guys have played connect four okay great here's the thing about connect four wouldn't it be great if you just got to make four moves real quick. Right? We could always win. If I, if I only had these four little pieces, and I could just drop them in here real quick, connected them all, I win. That'd be awesome. I love to win. I don't know how I made it as a Razorback fan this long. I'm dedicated dedicated to the cause Lord bless us it'd be great but how many of you know that that's not how you play the game right whenever you get a couple in a row the other team the other person who you're playing against they're going to take a different color and they're going to try to what they're going to try to block you from getting your four in a row well just like the game of connect four how many of you know that we have an adversary who's going to try to come along and whenever you get a couple in a row and you feel like hey i've connected with god hey i'm connecting with family things are really starting to go good and all of a sudden he'll block you and then if you're not paying really close attention you'll just drop the other two in there and think okay i'm good i'm done but you didn't actually get all four connected because there was a disconnect because we have an adversary we have an enemy we have an opponent who we have to overcome that's why it's good on a pretty regular basis to go back and check the foundation to go back and check the basics really do some self-evaluation and say am i really connecting with God am I really connecting with God on a regular basis or am I just going through the motions of the game am I really reaching out to family to church family am I really making an effort to be connected on that real level am I really reaching out am I being faithful in my attendance am I being faithful to my church community? Am I being faithful to the community where God has called us to go and make disciples? Am I being faithful to reach out? It's good to check in on the basics. There will always be a reason 
to stay disconnected. The enemy will always give you a reason to stay disconnected. My challenge to you today is to choose to connect despite all the reasons that there are to disconnect. Choose to connect.